see all of you here on a, on a little more chilly uh, Sunday morning. Glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, uh, please uh, let someone know that you're visiting.
Almighty God, we thank you for allowing us again to gather in this your house of worship. We pay homage to you, our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, our Provider, our Healer, our everything, God. For we live and move and have our being in you, O oh God. Bless, we ask, the needs of our church family as you know and understand them to be. We continue to pray for the Watry family and their loss of their brother, sister in law, and family member. Continue to pray for. Lynn and Mike, Bone, Larry, Garland Nettles, and all those who remain on our prayer list as we, as we know it to be. And for all throughout our community and the world at large who are suffering sickness, death, fighting the battle their life with the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected their bodies, oh God. Have mercy. Have mercy on these and all of us, dear Lord, we ask and pray. Touch the sick and restore their health Make them whole again, we ask. You are the great physician, O Lord. You will all power and authority over our bodies. So do what only you can for these. Comfort their loved ones in the meantime. And reassure them that you are indeed in control of all that happens in our lives and theirs. Thank you that you know more about our yesterdays than we do about our tomorrows. And you know more about our tomorrows than we do about our yesterdays. Help us, Lord, never to lose hope and always Believe that you are exceedingly abundantly able to do beyond what we can ask or imagine. For you alone are God. And we worship you as such. We praise you for the season at hand. We ask that you would further prepare us, O oh God, as we go through Advent with anticipation and a hope that assures us that Christ has come, Christ is coming, and Christ will come again. We pray and ask this in the name of our Messiah, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray as he did. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
say the least. I told somebody recently that I love Easter music, but seemingly so Christmas music touches my heart as much so, not more. Tis the season, a season of excitement and anticipation as I pray just now. And we give thanks to God for allowing us, even in the midst of a pandemic such as the one that we're experiencing now, gather as Christians here and around the world, whether we be present in body or spirit, uh, or at home or online watching a service or worshiping together, I should say, it really makes no difference. Uh, in the end, what's important is our hearts are in that moment and that we truly, truly honor and glorify God with our presence, with our prayers, with our gifts and service and witness. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? Thank you for being here. We praise the Lord for your participation in this meaningful service and experience, to say the least. Our scripture comes from both the Old Testament and New Testament. We'll read from Zechariah chapter 9, uh, which is a prophecy that was fulfilled some 500 years later, which we'll read about as it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21. So Lynn, if you would come and read those two scripture re lessons for us. Please stand if you can for the scripture reading. <laughs> I will begin with Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. So Matthew 21, <coughs> verses 1 through 11. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead, Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy said, that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh Lord, send forth your word so that it will not come back void, but 
rather will accomplish in us what you intend for it to. Speak now, O oh God, as your servants listen. And may it be done unto us individually and collectively according to your will. We ask in Jesus' name. Most people in Jesus' day failed to recognize Him. Him as the Messiah and the King that He was and is and will forever be. Simply because they were expecting a different, a different kind of Messiah and King or Savior. They were not anticipating Him riding on a donkey, although that was what kings did in such times. But they were looking for someone who would be riding on a white horse or stallion which symbolized a great warrior, if you will, who would lead them out of oppression by the Roman government. So when he rode into Jerusalem that day on the colt of a donkey, there was a message that he was not, as I just said, the Messiah they were expecting, whether he was coming as a humble servant and suffering servant to die, to die as he already understood and accepted was his lot. He would not be that great military and political king that Israel wanted him to be. So they totally and tragically missed the coming of their Savior. And by doing so, they forfeited the greatest salvation they could have ever hoped for that they could have ever hoped for. Unfortunately, many people today do the same tragic thing. And they miss Jesus for who He truly is because of their wrong expectations. They too are looking for a Savior who will instantly, instantly solve their deepest problems. They're looking for a Savior who will grant them their every wish and keep them from every kind of suffering and difficulty. And sadly but true, they miss out on the greatest gift this world has ever known. And by doing so, they, like the Israelites of Jesus' day, forego the blessings that Christ offers to all who accept Him for who He really is. Who is He? He's the Son of God. He's the Son of God made flesh who came not to bring victory and peace by way of a war. Rather by dying on a cross. By dying on a cross and sacrificing His own body and blood for 
their sins and our sins and the whole world's sin. So in order to joyously receive and welcome Jesus as the Messiah and King He is with the kind of enthusiasm and expectation He deserves, we must, we must understand who He is. And to do that, Properly, we must, we must accept by faith, by faith what the Word of God teaches us about His Son, our Savior, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. We cannot pick and choose what is said about the Messiah to suit our own liking. We've got to take the whole as it is presented. And not just about who He is, but what He expects of those who choose to follow Him. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And a lot of people struggle. They don't mind recognizing that He is say, the King of Kings, but when it comes to doing what kings expect their subjects to do, they struggle. And the fact of the matter is, we all do in that department at times, do we not? We all do. And those of Jesus' day were no exception. But if we do recognize Him as the Son of God that He is, and we strive with all the, the, the obedience and trust that we can muster up to obey Him or to follow Him and His teachings, then and only then can we genuinely sing Hosanna, which by the way means save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Even in the midst of the worst of pandemics that we may be facing now or later. Because our, our happiness, our joy more specifically, is not found in circumstances, our joy is found in Christ and Christ alone. And He has promised to be with us regardless of those circumstances, be they the best of the best or the worst of the worst. And nothing can change that. Not even the devil himself who wants us to believe otherwise. Christ came for such a purpose. Christ comes for such a purpose. as it was foretold hundreds and even thousands of years ago that he would. Zechariah chapter 9 is no different. It is one of those many prophecies. In fact, it's one of the greatest messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. For it teaches us that because Jesus is king, he comes to rule and reign over those who are his subjects. Are you one of his subjects? If so, he has the right 
and the authority to rule over everything you say, think, or do. Does he not? To be sure, this is difficult, as I said earlier, for us to accept because our sinful nature, our sinful nature seeks to convince us that we, that we have the right to rule and reign over our hearts. How many of you have tried that and how did that work out for you? It all but destroyed me and my life, literally, spiritually, in every other way. And it will do, do the same for anybody who chooses the world over the Word. I find it interesting that many, specifically Americans, but in other countries too, can accept their government calling the shots as long as it doesn't go too far with its laws or legislation. But if a king tries to control every aspect of our lives, be it how we do business, how we relate to others, or how we speak and think, we immediately resist and rebel. We start protesting and politicking. Any of that sound familiar? And no doubt we do struggle with rejoicing at the coming of that kind of king. Hear what I'm about to say. But friends, that's precisely the type of king that Jesus is. He seeks to, he deserves to rule and reign in all of our hearts. And to call the shots whether we agree or not. And you can either accept that or you can reject it. But be willing to pay the consequence which ain't good, excuse my English, if you choose to reject it. It didn't turn out too good for those who crucified him, I dare say, except for the select few who finally admitted that he was who he said he was the king of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. Jesus, my friends, has every right to tell you and me and all the rest what, when, where, how, and why we're to do what he says. And what should be our response? Really? Lord? You, you, you want me to do what? You want me to do how? And when? And where? No, according to what Zacharias and the Scripture as a whole says, we're supposed to rejoice. And rejoice greatly regarding this king. And if we understand him as he truly is and what his coming means to our salvation, how can we do anything less? How can we do anything less than rejoice? My brothers and sisters, it is for our benefit, yours and mine, that Jesus has come and Jesus is coming and He will come again. And to receive those benefits, we first must recognize our need for such a Savior. Make no mistake about it. 
regardless of what Jesus says we must do and how we must do it and when we must do it and why we must do it, He always, He always has our best interests at heart. Always. What are the odds? Or what were the odds that one man could fulfill all 300 or so prophecies? as did Jesus that were made so far apart from the other. As I said, it had been 512 or so years that Zacharias prophesied what he did about the coming Messiah. It's staggering. It's staggering so far as the odds that one man could come and do what Jesus did and does and promises that he will in the life hereafter. But 2,000 years ago, on Palm Sunday, as we refer to it as being, Jesus indeed fulfilled Zacharias and all of the prophecies made concerning his coming by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey to the cries of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And not only did he ride in on a donkey, soon thereafterwards, he paid the ultimate price. The ultimate price. For no fault of his own. By being flogged first. I don't know about you, but I don't want anything to do with flogging. That was worse, I think, than being crucified. But he endured that for your sins. For your sins and my sins and every sin. That alone is cause for rejoicing. I know this is not going to feel good, but I need to say this. Yet we come and we sit in our pews and we may say an amen if the preacher encourages you to do so. We don't seem to have the joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven the way that God deserves for us to express in our worship, be it on Sunday morning or Monday morning or all the days of the week. I guarantee you, when we get to heaven, we won't be just sitting around with masks on our face, I promise you. There's going to be some shouting. There's going to be some singing. There's going to be some worshiping like we've never known in this life. So as we prepare to approach this Holy Sacrament Communion, the Lord's Supper as it's referred to. Ask yourself the question, is Christ my King? Does He rule and reign in my heart the way that He deserves and has the right to? Am I living my life in one big, gigantic, endless Hosanna. To Him in the highest. 
understanding that without Him and the price He was willing to pay for my sins, I would be lost forever and ever and eternally damned. I trust that you can say with all the assurance that any human being can that he is indeed your king. He is your Messiah. And you are willing, though you, like all the rest of us, will stumble and fall in your trust and obedience of Christ. Nevertheless, He doesn't stop loving us. He doesn't stop loving us. And is always willing to forgive if we are always quick to confess and repent. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for reminding us again or for the first time of who your Son truly is and what he expects of every one of us who choose to be his followers. We welcome your rule and reign, O oh God, in our hearts. Knowing we have stumbled and fallen and we have missed the target many times past and we will again. That doesn't change your love for us. The same love that sent your son Jesus the first time, sends him in the present time and is going to send him for the last time when he comes not as the Savior, not as the Savior, but as the judge of all of humankind. No God, if there be any here today, any man or woman that has not made their decision to follow you by confessing and repenting of their sin, seeking your grace and mercy for their personal life, oh God, through your Spirit, speak to them right now. So that they and all of us can celebrate this, this sacrament in a way we've never experienced before or that they have. Do your work, God, in all of us. Further prepare us, not only for Christmas, but for that grand and glorious day when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ will rise and those who have been faithful in obedience to you will be caught up with them in the air. Without a doubt, that could happen at any moment. And Lord, when that time comes, there won't be an opportunity for us to be born again. The time will have run out. So God, again, we pray for those who are lost and who do not know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Be they here or be there in our family, be they in our community and around the world, God, wherever those persons are, we lift up this prayer in their behalf and ask your will to be done in them for them. Open the eyes of their hearts that they may see Christ as He truly is. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite all of you to take
take out your little cup and wafer and just hold it for a few moments. Even those of you who are following online that we hopefully got the elements to, if we did not, please let us know. If you know anybody in our church family that may not have received the elements, let me office know as soon as possible so that we can make sure that happens in the, in the months to come. I invite you now to follow along on the screen for the closing of our service and the liturgy. Christ the Lord invites to this table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, our sins are to be handed in care, to will to die, and to need to undo. Forgive when our lips tremble today what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from the past that we cannot change, open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
you'll take out your cup. There's two things you have to separate. There's the top tab. Take that plastic tab and peel it back. First, you get your wafer out. Leave the other closed for now. Peel. Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and remember us of him. Now if you'll fill the top of your cup carefully. This, my fellow Christian, is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and remember us again. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for allowing us again to feast, feast at your table on your love and grace through Christ our Savior. Bless each and every one of these and all those around the world whose faith is indeed in Christ and Him alone. Continue to fill us, O oh God, with your presence and your power through the Holy Spirit. Send us forth as prepared people for a prepared place so that the world will take notice of it and ask, why? Why are we so filled with joy, peace, and hope that we might in turn tell them about Jesus, the Messiah, our King, and our Savior. We pray and ask it in His holy name and for His sake. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, Lo, in the air, our truth.
Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit further bless you, keep you, and make God's face shine upon you and smile on you as you go and represent Him to this lost and dying world.